good afternoon ladies and gentlemen a very warm welcome to you all and wishing you all on the first monday of october a very happy world architecture day hope most of you are back at your workplace and keeping healthy and safe and have adopted well to this new normal during this uh, unlocking phase it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar canadian wood presents wood on wood innovations celebrating architecture and design it's heartwarming to see such a fabulous response to this webinar series brought to you by architect and interiors india you can see the numbers swelling thank you for taking time out and being here today my name is indrajit sauji i head the construction and design vertical for itp in india and i'll be your host today let me begin with a brief about itp itp media group is one of the largest foreign media companies in india The group now publishes more than 100 weekly and monthly magazines and has a wide portfolio of market leading digital properties. Some of our well-known global titles include magazines like Harper's Bazaar, Vogue, Time Out, Cosmopolitan, Grazia, Construction Week, Architect and Interiors India and more similar prominent titles across industry verticals. In India we have seven titles including Architect and Interiors India. Architect and Interiors India is a flagship title and is among the most respected and widely read B2B titles in its domain. And as we gather today to celebrate World Architecture Day, we are fortunate to have galaxy of stars from the design industry with us to take us through the journey so far and guide us what the future looks like for us. We are looking forward to an interactive and engaging session and need your complete involvement and to ensure this we'll take a few questions during the session. For those who want to ask a question We have enabled our ask a question feature. It's on the control panel at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions just type them there. I promise we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. And if you miss anything don't worry. We'll be sending around an on demand recording to your mailbox and it will also be available on our website as well. Without any further delay, let me introduce our partner for today's session, Canadian Wood. Thank you Canadian Wood for partnering with us and for helping us run this celebration today on occasion of World Architecture Day. We have Nirmala Thomas with us representing Canadian Wood. Nirmala Thomas is Director India Marketing Market Development for Astri Innovation Consulting India FII India. That's what uh, that that we know as Canadian Wood. FII India is the market development agency for promoting Canadian sol, uh, Canadian solid wood lumber from the certified sustainable forest of British Columbia. Canada with over 17 years of experience in strategic marketing in India and internationally Nirmala leads FII India India's educational and direct outreach activities to a wide range of audiences her rich experience of working in different roles with varied industries brings to the table a sound understanding of the market and its requirements she is an engineering graduate with a post graduation in international marketing from University of Pune Nirmala lives in Mumbai and enjoys spending time with her family now without any further ado let me hand over the forum to nirmala nirmala the forum is all yours thank you for the thank wonderful you. introduction indrajit uh, good afternoon everyone um, i just will take a, a quick few minutes uh, welcome to this webinar wood innovation celebrating architecture and design uh, today the first monday of october every year is celebrated as world architecture day in parallel with the un world habitat day This idea was originally created by the International Union of Architects (UIA) in the year 1985. By choosing the theme "Clean Environment for a Healthy World" in 2021, the International Union of Architects hoped to contribute to the global conversation on the 2030 Development Agenda by focusing on three key areas: that is, housing, public spaces, and their relation to climate change. We would like to appreciate the great work architects do and the potential they have to better the world. marking the occasion of world architecture day we take a moment to consider the potential of sustainable architecture and its ability to transform the lives of human beings across the world sustainable architecture is nothing but a reflection of the choice of building materials construction methods resources used and design in general today we celebrate architecture day by taking time out to learn about the wonderful works of architecture in india through our esteemed panel members uh before i hand it over to um, the next uh, speaker i just will quickly run you through a short presentation on canadian wood and its story and why we believe canadian wood is the right choice when it comes to using certified wood from sustainably managed forests of british columbia canada please allow me to share screen so canadian wood also known as fi india is the crown agency of the government of british columbia 
We are a non-profit organization with a mandate to educate and promote use of BC forest wood products. Can you go ahead, please? Yeah, as you can see from here, Canada is a nation of forests. It has 10% of the world's forest cover and has the number of highest certified number of um, forests in the world. So if you can see from the slide here, British Columbia is the westernmost province of Canada and has 40% of Canada's forests present here. It houses some of the largest lumber companies um, in the world, some of them uh, namely like uh, WFP, West Fraser, Canfo, Tolco, and Interfo. So just sharing statistics as available on the government website, annual harvest generally does not cross 200,000 hectares, which is seen as a small dot. And that is what we actually harvest in Canada. It's just a 1% of the entire forest land. From the uh, slide itself, you can see British Columbia is recognized as a global leader in sustainable forest management. As seen in the chart above, British Columbia ranks third in comparison with Canada as number one. So in fact, the country and the province itself are leadingly certified. So that itself um, kind of uh, justifies strict international certification standards like FSC, PFC, make Canada a reliable and sustainable provider of wood products. Canadian Wood has been actively promoting wood as a sustainable source of raw material in various applications through its five legally sourced species, namely Western Hemlock, Spruce Fine Fir, Douglas Fir, Yellow Cedar, and Western Red Cedar. Canada has strict forest laws and policies. About 94% of Canada's forests are publicly owned, and this enables the government to regulate harvesting practices and land use planning. If you can see from the picture here, the small patches of land where there is no forest, that's the small piece of land or the forest that has been harvested. You actually won't be coming back to this place for the next 80 to 100 years because that's how well managed the uh, entire system is. It is a well-known fact in Canada that for every tree that is harvested, three new saplings are planted. So the whole logic behind this is that even if two saplings do not make it, at least one is insured. So it is for every tree cut, there is a tree planted. And these are planted in nurseries and managed and looked after till they grow up to seven years of age. These saplings, which you saw nurtured uh, in the nurseries in the previous picture, are now planted back in the same environment where the harvesting of trees takes place. So this allows the biodiversity to be maintained along with the regrowing of forests. So the entire ecosystem, whether it is the birds, the, so it, it's, we just don't cut trees and plant them elsewhere. It is planted back in the same environment where it is harvested from. Everybody knows that forests and trees are the world's greatest carbon absorption tools. This continuous um, endless uh, cycle of carbon absorption this management of growing and harvesting trees in a controlled cycle helps take carbon out of the air and store it in different forms of products that we use in our everyday life. Name it books, name it furniture, name it construction material. This is all carbon absorbed in the air and stored. So it is a very well-known fact as trees grow when they are young, they continue to absorb carbon. But when they start aging, they, as they die off, they tend to release. So it is a natural cycle that you cut down mature trees, not young trees, so that when you actually are taking out carbon from the air. It's also important to know that India loves wood and uh, the fact that India needs to import wood because we are a fiber deficit country. So Canada thus provides a reliable source of sustainable certified and versatile lumber. We truly believe use wood Use wood from wherever you want, whether it's local, domestic, or imported, but make sure that it is coming out of sustainably managed forest. I think this wood miles picture is what we have, uh, our research scientists in Canada have kind of captured it. Even though it does take a certain carbon footprint to get wood from Canada to here into India, but still the amount of, of uh, carbon dioxide that has been captured negates whatever has been lost in while shipping it. That's, so just quickly, uh, possibilities are endless with wood, what we call as reimagine with wood. Wood can actually elevate architectural projects, achieve sustainability goals, and create inspiring structures. Just sharing with you uh, as pictures now, a couple of works made by different architects in India, what we call as made in India, made with Canadian wood. 
So this is the pallet pub in Bengaluru, um, the, uh, captured by uh, architect Ketan Javdekar. This is the CPT University in Ahmedabad with uh, one of our first uh, uh, projects where we installed uh, glue lamp Douglas fir beams. Uh, this is a private residence in Himachal, uh, where uh, a post and beam kind of tr truss frame structure was used in construction as well as interiors. Uh, this is a WFC house, what we call as a wood frame construction standing. It's a two-story residential house existing in Mysuru, a WFC house in Chennai. And that's a beautiful piece of, um, you know, the circular staircase that you see all made in wood. This stands in Chennai, a WFC house in Mysuru. Uh, it, this is what we call, Peter would term it very well, as modular and portable. We had it installed. We broke it down into parts and had it installed at the exhibition. It's currently standing in Mysuru. Uh, this is another small, uh, small one studio uh, cottage style WFC house in Bengaluru. It's um, if you ever are there, you could uh, probably just drop in to see it. Uh, it's it's fully fitted with interior furniture. Uh, this is one of the um, uh, WFC houses in Hyderabad. It's actually a commercial project where a customer actually wanted to build in wood and has has used this design. We have captured it out of that. This is a Tangan Grooves Resort style Goa house. Uh, it's 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 ideal for um, uh, getaway as a getaway home. And uh, next slide shows you also the interiors. The interiors, this is the interior fit out of the same TNG style uh, resort house in Goa. And this is, uh, I think this has been showed before. Yeah, next slide. A Bell Museum in Trivandrum where he's used uh, both the uh, wood paneling out, uh, as a cladding outside as well as uh, in the interiors. This is Taj Rishikesh where they have used uh, Douglas fir and uh, hemlock as into their different interior fitments in their door frames and uh, beautifully done. Um, you must visit this place. It's a beautiful piece. And lastly is the Sitaram. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, the Sitaram Ayurvedic Resort in Kerala, which has again used Canadian wood. Just wanted to formally uh, open the webinar before we proceed with the panel discussion. I would like to introduce to you Annabelle LaRouche, uh, Councillor, Commercial and Senior Trade Commissioner, High Commission of Canada in India. Annabelle is responsible for managing Canada's trade investment and innovation relationship with India, as well as with Nepal and Bhutan. Prior to assignment in New Delhi, she was Councillor and Trade Commissioner at the Embassy of Canada in Seoul from 2016 to 21. From 2014 to 16, Annabelle also worked with the Canadian missions in EU member states to promote the Canada-EU Economic Trade Agreement. Um, over to you, Annabelle. Please, can you go ahead. Thank you, Nirmala, for the kind introduction, for the great presentation and also beautiful example of wood construction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. First, I'd like to thank Architect and Interiors India and Can Canadian Wood for inviting me on the occasion of the World Architecture Day. It's a very special day. I'm very pleased to be part of this webinar, and I commend Canadian Wood for bringing together eminent personalities from the world of architecture to share their knowledge and, and their expertise. I'm part of the Trade Commissioner Service, or TCS, a government of Canada organization helping Canadian companies navigate international markets. In India, we have eight offices across the country and about 50 officers working towards facilitating cross-border trade and investment between Canada and India, including in the forestry and the wood sector. India is one of Canada's most important trading partners, with a total economic partnership that we estimate at around $100 billion. As you all know, the COVID pandemic has changed the world in many ways. And this change includes turning us back to the use of environmentally friendly products like wood, and not just any wood, but wood from sustainably managed forests. Proudly, as Nirmala mentioned in her presentation, Canada is a world leader in this area. Only 10% of the world's forests are certified, but in Canada, about half of our forests are. This means that Canada alone accounts for one third, over one third of the world forest certification, far ahead of any other countries in the world. Further, Canada's forestry sector uses almost 100% of every tree harvested. With wood chips, sawdust, and bark, we make products like toilet paper, masks, hospital gowns, bioplastics, textiles, and biofuels. And we ensure sustainable forest practices by planting 600 million seedlings per year. From building taller with carbon storing wood to using wood chips to make bioplastics, innovation in our forest sector is decreasing our carbon footprint and ensuring that Canada remains a leader in the forestry sector. I would like to leave you with one message. As one of the largest producers of softwood lumber and leader in sustainable forest management and forestry innovation, Canada is uniquely positioned to meet India's growing needs for wood products. 
I thank you all for being here today. I wish you a very productive discussion. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Over to you, Nirmala. Thank you very much. Uh, I would now, uh, without taking much of time, I would hand it over to Sumisha. Sumisha is the editor for Architects and Interior to continue with the panel discussion. Please, over to you, Sumisha. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nirmala. That was a lovely start to the evening. It was enjoyable to see your presentation. And it was an absolute pleasure to hear from you, Anibal. Thank you for joining us today. It's now time for the most awaited panel discussion, and it gives me immense pleasure to be seated amongst the finest architects of the country on this occasion of World Architecture Day. We often tend to take architecture and our surroundings for granted, and thus this day has come into existence. Architecture Day is a day to show appreciation for the work of architects and celebrate their contribution to, their society, to our society. Today's session by Canadian Wood and Architect and Interiors India is our way to bring the spotlight on the future of design and architecture and reinforce the need to look at sustainable architecture as mainstream. We want to encourage more and more young architects and designers to take up the responsibility of building with natural materials like wood and discuss the innovations that can be brought about using this fabulous material. We also want to reinforce the need, at look, need to look at procuring materials through sustainable and ethical sources. On that note, I would like to introduce you all to our esteemed speakers today. Our first panelist is none other than architect Tony Joseph, principal architect Stapati. Tony established Stapati in 1989, which has steadily grown into a multidisciplinary practice, emphasizing values of integrity, sustainability, and innovation. Tony is also the founder chairman of Agni Institute of Design, a center for excellence in architecture and design education. Welcome, Tony. Next, we have architect Ravindra Kumar, a crusader of urban design in India and a patron of sustainable location-specific architecture and design. He is also the director of design at Venkatraman Associates and principal architect Pragro. Next on our panel, we have architect Ini Chatterjee, principal architect Ini Chatterjee and Associates. He currently practices architecture from Goa and has been working with coconut wood for 15 years now. Next, we have architect Siddharth Das, in 2002, Siddhartha founded the multidisciplinary practice Siddhartha Das Studio in Delhi that works on responsible design and cultural space. He has worked with over 2,500 craftspeople across 15 states. In fact, over the last 20 years, he has worked on more than 100 projects across eight countries. He is also the vice chairman of the JD Center of Art, Bhubaneswar. Next, I would like to welcome architect Arjun Malik, principal architect, principal architect Malik Architecture. Arjun is the second generation architect at Malik Architecture, a practice established by his father, Kamal Malik. He has completed Master of Science in Advanced Architecture Design at Columbia University and has been working with Malik Architecture full time since 2005. He has contributed tremendously to the growth of the firm in all spheres. Our next panelist, Eugene Pandala, is an architect, urban designer and heritage conservator known for buildings with biodiversity, inclusive environmental sustainability. Welcome, Eugene. Last but not the least, we have Mr. Peter Bradfield, who is the Technical Advisor, Forestry Innovation Consulting India, which is FII India, or as we all know as Canadian Wood, since 2015. With over 40 years of international experience in the Canadian forest products industry, Mr. Bradfield leads the technical and educational approach in the use of Canadian Wood, in demonstration and commercial projects in India. A very warm welcome to all of you and thank you once again for joining us. I'm now going to straight dive into our conversation. Just a note for all our lovely viewers, if you have any questions for our panelists, you can put them down in the chat box and I will try and address them as and when I can. Let's start the discussion with the most pertinent question. And this one goes to you, Mr. Chatterjee. How is the pandemic going to impact architecture and design in the coming years? I don't see uh, any linkage, actually, in that sense. I mean, unless if there is an, any at all, it would be people would start preferring a rural lifestyle as opposed to an urban one. And then it would change the architecture and the materials, I guess, then, you know. I'm sure a lot of people are now looking at sustainability as more mainstream and I guess I'm hoping and we're all hoping that more and more people start uh, focusing on sustainable architecture and using sustainable products like wood in the post-pandemic phase as well. Uh, Ravi, you work on a lot of large-scale projects and sustainability projects. 
Would you like to define and tell us what does sustainability really mean to you? I think uh, what is very important is not to, you know, like let us say, go blah, 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 blah. You know, it's very important that we have to introspect exact engineering evaluation. It's not about uh, the aesthetic or the uh, understanding of how much you have actually captured the momentum of being an architect or making the space architectonic. Mm-hmm. I think uh, it matters a lot in terms of how we get our numbers right. You know, mm-hmm. whether you use uh, the timber, so what is the source of that timber? What, you know, what is the accurate footprint of that in terms of the transport consumption? That if it comes from Canada, what happens? You know, uh, uh, so every material needs to have uh, an energy kind of a evaluation criteria, and also understand as to what happens to that material once the structure completely dilapidates and goes back to earth. How much of that will actually become? you know, earth, biodegrade and become earth. So I think these are pertinent questions for us, which is, which is very simple. And actually, if you look at, you know, one of my lecture topics, which I love to do is fast forward, which means if you go back into time, you learn better than actually going forward to time. So, so people did that very consciously and accurately. And uh, we need to become more passive in our methods to approach problems. And then I think we are accurate, sustainable sort of persona for the planet. Absolutely. I agree with you. Siddhartha, how would you define sustainability from your point of view? I work largely in the domain of culture and context, you know, of how do you really link livelihoods, people and places. And when you do that, I mean, the whole idea, the premise is that there's a responsibility and sensitivity of how do you really you know, relate to people mm-hmm. and then to resources, especially in a country where we have such amazing disparities, where there's such amazing lack of access. So that any resource that is used, even if there's an indulgence of the resource, it's used with great caution. Mm-hmm. And I think there, I think, lies this whole relevance of ecology and of using sustainable wood. So I think, and I think it's part of any ecosystem that there was. And I think there's a whole erosion of those systems, which are cyclical in some ways. Absolutely agree with you. Arjun, what you are aware mm-hmm. of the trends globally, especially in the US, in Canada, in Europe, you uh, definitely had access and have been working around. Uh, a lot of people are now moving towards using wood in their projects. So what are, what are the benefits of using wood in place of steel and concrete in your opinion? First of all, I'm not really aware of trends all over the world and I'm not exactly sure what the word trends means anymore. Um, it implies something very short term. I, I think the I think what Ini has said and what Siddharth has said and what Ravi has said it kind of sums up the attitude towards sustainability, right? I mean, part of it is number crunching, part of it is materials, part of it is, you know, ecology and sociology, uh, part of it is economy, and it's contextual. I mean, obviously, sustainability in the developed world of American or centric is very different uh, from sustainability in, um, in, you know, places like India, you know, more developing nations. Uh, where we have to be very frugal in our consumption of resources, where in other places you apparently seem to consume more and more in order to save, which is something I haven't quite um, gotten my head around. So I don't think it can be kind of shoehorned into a single set of you know buzzwords, which is, I think, what the media industry keeps looking for. But uh, I think it needs to be a concerted analytical uh, approach from you know numerous viewpoints. Uh, there is no one single weapon to deal with this in, in a sense. I absolutely agree with you. So if you had to decide, define sustainability for the future, how, what are the parameters that you would look at and where would probably would come in that picture? I just told you it can't be defined and you asked me to define it. Look, so I parameters think, is what uh, I was looking at. Yeah. Look, obviously, uh, looking at uh, um, you know natural resource, material resource, um, the ecologies or the human resource used to mobilize those natural resources, looking at supply chain logistics. Um, I think it's all kind of out there, right? I think it's just a question of how you you tend to use it. There's there's very little that can be said uh, about the principle of sustainability. It's just a question of how uh, motivated you are, how um, committed you are to the cause in terms of applying those principles. And look, everyone would love to work with natural materials, right? Uh, why would an architect choose to not work with it? I think there are, there are you know, limiting factors in terms of uh, there is, you know, cost. We are talking about supply, 
provenance accreditation becomes a problem when it comes to engineering. Um, I think engineering knowledge becomes an issue, right? Execution becomes an issue. Right? I already mentioned economy, which is the major one. So I think if you're still seeing it in India, I think kind of being mobilized at a slightly smaller scale. Whilst uh, when I was fortunate enough to travel with, uh, you know, Canadian who took us across to, you know, to Vancouver and we went and saw a lot of projects and you're kind of seeing how a society is now right from the forest to the installation to the recyclability. So the complete cycle, right, is being refined to the kind of level where I think we have a lot to learn, uh, you know, in terms of how we can adapt those strategies into our mainstream, not as, you know, boutique applications, because that's just a little, uh, you know, it's just a little pebble in the pond. It's not going to do much. Absolutely. I think motivation is the key word, like you mentioned as well. Uh, Mr. Joseph, would you like to tell us what are the different good species that you've used in your project and uh, which ones and what is your thought process behind choosing them since you work so much in wood? I'm sorry, I have yet to use Canadian wood. <laughs> yeah. Mostly. That's all right. What have you been using so far in uh, your experiences? Mostly, mostly it has been. Uh, Upcycling, I think we are use the projects which I have been doing uh, are mostly resorts and other things where we use a lot of wood and mostly yeah, a lot of recycled wood is being used. No? I think uh, when we talk about recycling, that is one of the beauty of wood is that no, you can totally recycle it, uh, upcycle it. We use it in various ways. And uh, yeah, the, the if you look at the old the houses in Kerala, they were all wooden houses and one of the most uh, majorly one of the wood which was used was called Anjali. We call Anjali locally. It is a type of uh, wild jack wood which was used. And uh, as it ages, it becomes really beautiful and it really hardens and it has got wonderful quality now. Uh, we have reused it and I think after 100, 150 years, uh, we have taken those wood and we are using it and I'm sure it will survive another 100 years easily. So that is the beauty of wood. You know? Naturally, uh, nowadays a lot of imported wood comes like Pincoda. Huh? Uh, and uh, we, uh, Pincoda is from uh, Myanmar mostly, uh, which is uh, being used because of the cost effectiveness and uh, the, I mean, the characters. And teak, of course, is something which has been used a lot in, in Kerala. Then on, in various cases, am I, can I show some images? Sure. Me, yeah, just run through some of the ways we have used to it. Huh? That would be nice. This is one of the projects which we have done about 25 years back, where most of the wood you see are recycled wood, except for the, huh? except for the ones, the rafters there which is been got it is all recycled wood, which we got from older houses which were being demolished and sold. So a lot of the wood which we have used for recycle. This is a project in Goa where we have used spin corda, which was a wood, which I told you earlier, is being used because of the cost effectiveness. And uh, uh, what we understand, it is being, uh, it is a plantation wood, like, I mean, it is being, uh, yeah. So this shows some of the drawings, which you can see how when we make a drawing, the way we use the wood, how we do that. And Very beautiful. Again, this is a project where every material in this uh, project itself was recycled. And here, what we have used is arcana trees. And this is a thing, a wood which was usually thrown out. And we have used this arcana wood uh, here, which uh, these guys who make these galleries, they use it after, a, I mean, once they, once this project, this was a temporary thing for one of the Binale pavilions, which they reused it after this uh, event was over. Yeah, this is the same wood being used as a, uh, the, the, the arcanet wood, which is very rarely used for major timber constructions being used in the elevation of a, of a project. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is how the old houses were, the old wooden houses. This is one of the houses which were dismantled and you can see the areas where that old wood was used. 
I think these are the one house, the wood from that one house was used in various parts of one, uh, a new construction which was happening. So effectively, every bit of that wood was used. That is the beauty of wood. No? I mean, it is uh, carbon footprints are much less than that of steel, and then no, uh, then the, the, the wood itself can be reused. No? Yeah. So this is even for the furniture there. This is one of the projects which we have been working on with a with a uh, a firm in US Studio D plus R. This is in Los Angeles. Here we were actually looking at uh, cross laminated and blue lamp wood being used for a ground plus five structure. You know? So this is uh, on actually this construction. Uh, we just started working on that. And these are some of the initial presentations. So it's interesting that you know, uh, here, uh, my friend and I, we decided that you know, instead of steel, we should, there There are houses there in LA, which are using ground plus two and ground plus three. So we wanted to see whether we could use it huh, uh, on a higher, much taller structure. Yes, and this is a furniture which we are doing again, upcycling uh, of old wood. It is a, for a brand called Smaram, uh, which, we have been working on. Yeah. That looks really interesting. And uh, of course, we've all been, and there are people in the audience as well who are talking about the resorts that you've designed. In fact, we have a question that has come up for you where they're asking that there is any damage due to termites in wood, especially like wild jackfruit used in Kerala. Would uh, you like to take that? Yeah. I mean, naturally, uh, uh, if you see the idea of this. The, the, the furniture which we are talking about and where we use that wood, especially uh, the recycled wood. The beauty of that was all the 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 the, uh, the effect of what you call it termite on that wood. I think that was quite beautiful actually. I mean, once we uh, after we took it and you know, naturally treated it, it is not going to be affected anymore. Mm -hmm. But it was wonderful to see uh, the work of. Uh, termite on those wood. So when we used it, we actually left it as it is. Mm -hmm. So that adds to the quality of that. You know, I mean, so it all depends on how we are using it. But if we do the right treatment, I don't think there is any issue of termite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, th these woods have lasted more than 100, 150 years. So, and if it can last 150 years, and I think the way we have, we, I'm sure that when we are using it again, uh, it lasts even more than that. I mean, it is all about treat, how you treat the tooth and uh, whether whether the how you I mean the, how you approach designing with the wood, you know? Absolutely, I'm sure that's a big challenge and that's being addressed as well when you're using the product or using wood for the construction that you're doing, Mr. Padnala. I would like to know from you that you know how what are your thoughts on using wood for large constructions particularly, and what are the advantages of using wood? I am very conservative about uh, using timber, you know, because I love timber, but uh, I feel that timber can be used in a place which is more, which is really appropriate. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're using uh, new timber, I prefer to get it from a source which is sustainably you know, cultivated. So cultivated timber is what I prefer. In fact, in Kerala, we get uh, teak wood. The Britishers, uh, fortunately, they planted uh, Quite a, a humongous area of, uh, I mean, teak in the in the state. Uh, those days, you know, they wanted to uh, use teak as a as a building material for uh, for ships. And later on, we started building uh, with steel. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, cultivated timber in Kerala is uh, is available. It's available. But it's too expensive, you know. It's when you're talking about affordable sustainability. Sustainability is something which uh, we are talking now, you know, about people who can afford to build, use a lot of timber lavishly. And uh, but you know, I always feel that uh, sustainability is uh, something which should be made affordable, because uh, and uh, it is just not uh, just not the choice of materials, but also to do with biodiversity. Because you know, when you the whole uh, process of making a tree, you know, I mean, manufacturing a tree, it is really encouraging, you know, because it's just not producing any carbon footprint. It is only, you know, capturing the carbon dioxide, actually, 
it's helping the environment and it's mitigating the global i mean the problem that we have right now so timber can be used it should be used it should be reused and timber structures we have uh, amazing uh, number of timber structures which have been pulled out and then used uh, as as a as a furniture piece as a as a you know take, it is taken to build resorts now, i also do that in some uh, at time spent nothing else is possible if the uh, the people decide that they can't maintain that house they will uh, really try to pull it out so i my initial uh, way is to sort of to keep it there to help them to conserve it and uh, if it is not possible then we transplant we try to transplant it into some locations like what tony said so we can uh, transplant it but you know uh, actually making retrofitting that structure making it livable for the for the next generation is uh, much more challenging i have done a couple of projects like that in fact uh, uh, i can also show you some uh, slides shall i share some slides right now yeah sure yeah this is a very large project i've used timber i really used a lot of timber in this structure but uh, you know the, i used where timber is required in fact wherever it's visible where you want to show timber i used timber okay and where i can uh, do without timber i use steel and other kind of but there is a need for using uh, you know concrete i use it in a very minimal way only in places where it's absolutely required i use concrete so the, all the materials that is locally available is the is a is a thing of my first choice and timber of course because i, I, I this particular project I, i i was to tell a story to take a journey through the cultural and natural heritage of this area so i had to do some the roof has to be you know made uh, you know in the local uh, way where i used timber uh, to to showcase the, the the beautiful possibilities of timber the roof is partially done with uh, you know steel steel is used wherever it is uh, you know exposed wherever it is showcased that is done with the steel especially timber is so beautiful a material and traditionally it was used in certain uh, you know systems of construction like this, this is a radiating rafter uh, uh, you know a structure made with radiating rafter and the corner rafter itself is about 30 feet long you know? so it's a big challenge and the carpenter uh, the, the kind of artisans to build this kind of structure you know nowadays i don't think you can get any anyone who's, who can build this kind of uh, radiating rafter a lot of details so uh, timber in this case i wanted to showcase this you know the old uh, structural system that was so beautiful and it became uh, an important element in the structure so right. this is also a part of a, a building which was sort of taken out from a different location and is transplanted you not without losing much of its uh, its glory but using it and you know you even made some little bit of modifications to suit that kind of uh, requirement and we used it and this is another interesting project where i i had a, a beautiful opportunity to use based timber you know, they, my client had a lot of timber which was yeah, this is the kind of roofing system that we we uh, i was talking to you about you know, the, okay. the portions of the tile roof is 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 uh, made with steel and uh, the rest of the areas whatever is shown is made with uh, with the timber this is a radiating rafter you know the kind of the structure that i was talking to you about the the kind of traditional uh, design which is quite difficult to implement and uh, this is a, sl- a slide i was talking to you about uh, you know getting an old structure uh, you know to into the project area and reusing it okay so i'll i'll just go to the next slide this is a project which i i, I was just talking to you about you know after i didn't know that you could see that no problem slides yeah okay this is a, a project which i i i i got an opportunity to sort of work with waste timber and steel mm-hmm. and this was done in panna in madhya pradesh so uh, there was a lot of timber and steel and that was a resource which i was supposed to make use of 
and uh, I uh, could design. This was an opportunity for me to design a, a, a structure with uh, all wood. Even uh, the the recent one which we did, the the roof also is made with timber. Intelligent with timber. You know, it's, it was a big opportunity because you know I, that, that was all waste. So I managed to uh, do a design for the uh, instead of using tiles, I used uh, timber. That's so this is salwood, and uh, the kind of buildings that we had in Kerala. One you know, of timber. One of the most uh, beautiful thing is that you can make prefab structures. You can do it in a factory or in a place, and you get the craftsman to do do the work, and. So we we had to design the whole thing, then get it done, and uh, it was brought to the site and it was something. Like and this is a uh, tech, you know, which is left exposed to the uh, to the atmosphere, uh, done with timber. You know, like uh, I could do some plastic work, and uh, all timber structure, which is you know, which forms a part of the landscape. And even in structures where you are, we are making uh, walls with something else, you can go for wherever it's possible the waste timber can be utilized for making artifacts you know for the if you notice the lampshade that's the portion of the timber you know you could have the an assembly of uh, waste branches and uh, put it together the ceiling can be used uh, i mean can be made with timber like so another uh, project uh, which was quite interesting is that a 300 year old uh, structure which was to be pulled out, an old structure. You know, they just they were, they, they, they just asked me how, what I can do with that. You know? So it it was basically an, a, a, a a kind of uh, engineering task to retrofit it, improve the living condition. I mean, like uh, increase the height, make washrooms, make a leaky roof. Uh, I mean, better. Increase, I mean, the increase in height and, uh, you know, making the spaces bigger and uh, meaningful for a new uh, new kind of lifestyle. So, I, I mean, we, we, we used uh, the jacks to jack it up, increase the height and improve the house. You know, this is a, I mean, it's a very uh, nice process which we did to bring back the building for use and restore it. You know, to the possible way. The beauty of the timber, beauty of a timber structure is that you know it's it's so amazing. You don't have to do much on the texture and uh, only thing that we had to make uh, a bit of a tweaking on the in the interior spaces and add on certain finishes. Uh, and uh, so, so that is it. I mean, this is these are the kind of. Uh, then in this timber is a is a beautiful material, you know, and it's a, when you manufacture, it, especially what I'm, I'm talking about manufacturing is if you cult, you're cultivating if you're cultivating timber, it's not only just uh, dealing with the, with the carbon footprint. It's also uh, becoming a host for biodiversity. It's also we know only about what is happening above the uh, above the ground. But there's a lot of things happening below the ground. Every tree is interconnected, and uh, it becomes a very, a very important thing for the biodiversity to, to thrive in a low location. So I feel timber can be used. It's uh, it's a, one of the best material that we can use, but it should be uh, you know replenished. Timber is something which we can replenish. It's not like other material. So Absolutely, we... Mr. Pandala. In fact, that presentation was. Uh, quite interesting. It was nice to see the different variety of projects and goods that you have used across categories as well. I'm sure all the other panelists would agree with us. On that note, I would also like, uh, Mr. Uh, Ini Chatterjee, you use a lot of coconut wood and you've been doing so for the last 15 years. So we would like to see some of your works as well in coconut wood and also if you could tell us why have you particularly chosen coconut wood for your project? Yeah, I mean... Uh... Why coconut wood is an easy thing. It's um, kind of a agricultural crop. People in India plant millions and millions of coconut trees to benefit from the fruit and whatever else it gives. I mean, it gives many things. But there does come a time when it's old and about to fall down. 
that they harvest it. And if you just go by statistical, if it lasts 70 years, then one seventieth of the population of coconut trees dies every year. So it kind of makes sense to use it. Uh, the thing is that it's not really a tree in, in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it doesn't have a, the structure of wood. It's like more like a pipe with a very heavy wall thickness. So it's in how you cut it and how you extract the wood from a coconut tree. Is, well, it's something you have to learn. I did <laughs> spend a long time doing that. Absolutely. Uh, I would love yeah. to see some of your projects. With sure, them. sure. I'll just get someone to put it on. A lot of people have these queries that they didn't realize that wood could actually be used to bear the load of an entire structure. They always thought of wood to be used aesthetically. Would you like to elaborate on that as well? Yeah, so this is like what you can see here are coconut wood beams, uh, which are fixed to a concrete structure. Uh, these are la these are laminated coconut wood beams, like because you don't get a very big piece of wood out of coconut, like cross section wise. So these are about 16 mm by 65 mm, a hell of a lot of them. And then there's a kind of uh, go to the next slide. So I use um, Fevicol, like which is just white glue to join all this. I don't have much faith in it, so I also bolt the the beams to you know together. And the rest of it is all about how you fit the beam to the concrete, and this that's my trip. So <laughs> I enjoy doing all that. Yeah. So this is the other thing that I enjoy is like. The, the members are so effectively light that just two guys can just deal with it, you know, like it's not... Uh, My labor intensive. Yeah, it's not really. And uh, you can be very accurate and you can be very gentle with how you go about doing your work. You know what I mean? I mean, you can <laughs> take your time to set it up. It's not much of a problem. So these are... Old pictures of when the house wasn't really complete, but my my mother asked me to build a house for her, and uh, she had lived in Kerala for many years, and she was going to come and live with me in my land, and uh, she didn't have much money, and I was new to Goa. I have no reason why I actually chose coconut wood. I just somehow did some calculation about the price and how much wood I could get out of it, and uh, it seemed to work for me. It was very cheap those days. It was about like 100 rupees a cubic foot for a trunk, for a log. And I had a woodworking machine, so I, we could sort of work the log down into pieces. And we did some furniture with it just to check out, like, uh, you know, what is this thing? Like, how does it really work? And uh, <laughs> Uh, then we figured it's really very strong. I mean, as long as you use the right parts of the tree, it's very heavy and uh, it's very durable. So then it led us to this sort of a structure, which you can see here. It's entirely out of coconut wood. These are laminated beams. These are laminated columns. I mean, this, or these are kind of compact, like built up sea beams uh but yeah it's all just wood and screws bolts like yeah this is all sort of during the construction but it reveals a bit more than the finished thing next yeah so this is like this is what really turned me on this is the first time i was building with wood and when you see this coming out of the ground you know <laughs> you really don't feel like you harmed the planet at all and again, this is the same thing. There, it's light. You can just clamp it together. You know, sort of take your time, join it properly, very gently, without making any noise, etc. You know, that's my relationship with wood. I used to make lots of things with wood even as a kid. But that was uh, my relationship, and especially with coconut wood, it's a new one. But I'm, I'm really hooked onto it. It's like I, I have used imported Russian pine and Scandinavian pine and, and spruce and stuff. Uh, it's very convenient. It's even cheaper than coconut now. Uh, there's less labor. It's like it works. And I've built a small resort with that as well. There is a, some sort of skepticism about it being softwood. 
in India. You know, uh, most carpenters have no respect for it. They like hardwoods, you know, um, or heavy woods. They sort of go like this, oh, it's very light, you know. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy, I enjoy uh, pine uh, and cedar, especially, yeah. That did look fantastic, and I would love to see that structure at some point in time, for sure. Sure, sure. Arjun, there's a question from the audience to you, where you mentioned that uh, there is a issue along with execution of using wood. There is lack of engineering knowledge, and uh, they want to understand from you that what can be done to change the current scenario, and how can people be educated to use wood correctly? Okay. So before I kind of answer that question, I just wanted to uh, say something about, you know, what Ini said. And uh, uh, it's been a long time since we met, about four or five years. He very much just into the home that he was had just finished building for his mother. And, um, uh, you know, I got, a, I got a lesson in how to deal with wood and how to treat wood and how to work with it. It was a... Uh, it was quite a priceless experience, both in terms of the, the conversation, understanding his methods, and of course, being in that space. Uh, I don't think any of those pictures will ever do it justice. I know Indy is a very private person, so I don't think too many people are going to get into that house, but uh, we did, and it was a rare privilege. Um, all right. So I'm going to just... Uh, look, I'm going to answer that question. We talked about workmanship and engineering knowledge through the course of just running you through these images. Um just a quick prelude to one of these projects, 2012. Um, this is in Alibag, about a 15 to 20 minute boat ride from Bombay. We worked on a long and narrow site for a friend who um, who really wanted to live with nature, right? So right from the concepts to the architectural formations, to the materiality, to the techniques, everything to be in consonance with nature. And, uh, you know, a fairly heavily forested site. You can see one of the concept diagrams. We simply detected space between the trees, right? Uh, there were lots and lots of very, very old, very mature, very tall trees on the site. So we simply detected bubbles and spaces between them and said, this is where the house um, is going to happen. Now, uh, using the language of Konkan architecture, which has been around for centuries in this region, it's, you know, it's Kerala, it's Maharashtra, it's down the coast, even to Goa, of working with timber, uh, terracotta, you know, with the side, it process and just sneak a little bit more closely um, to understand the rules. Because the moment you shift away from, you know, more conservative building materials like concrete, you kind of need to recalibrate the way that you look at design, the way you engineer design into these components. And to kind of discover the rules of the system and then find where you can either hybridize or mutate those, um, you know, those systems. So, um, we know that Mangalore tiles have to be fitted in a particular way, you know, the double layered ventilated tile system onto a, uh, you know, approximately one foot spaced wooden batten system, which is then supported by a two foot space for the system. But the networks below that can then start to actually drift away from the typical post and truss systems and hybridize into something that is a combination of the truss, post and frame system. Right, some of the exonometrics that really uh, start to detect, you know, appropriations of tree branches and tree trunks as the primary load-bearing system of the house. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, what we've used is we've actually used uh, flitched members here for the primary load-bearing. So that's thin steel plates, uh, structural wood sections um, bolted together. I did notice in some of Innie's work, perhaps not as much as this, but uh, I think that combination of steel and wood actually allows you to, uh, you know, look at a very different spatial logic, you know, and the way that you can translate structures into that logic. Otherwise, if you want to translate slightly larger spans into wood, then they start to get very, very heavy, bulky, you know, expensive, sourcing those members. So working with flitch sections, at least for the primary and secondary, and then using the rafters and battens uh, as natural wood. And yeah, I think once you start to detect ways in which you can work with the you know, primary structural systems, it completely opens up uh, the way you can design and build with wood. 
And um, now this, uh, the woodwork here was actually executed by a team that we brought down from Kerala because as you may have seen with Tony and with Eugene, those guys are experts at the subject. Um, and we didn't want to take too many risks because it was something that we were learning as well. I'm going to take you to another project which was actually done through, uh, where the structural wood was done through a local carpentry team. Um, so as far as the engineering and construction goes, look, we have excellent woodworking teams right within the country, but I think most of them have been pushed into working with furniture level, you know, doors, windows, floorings, you know, roof claddings. Uh, very few of them now are working with, uh, you know, gravitational and seismic systems uh, in structural wood and in hybridized uh, steel and wood systems. So, uh, and I think that also carries over to the engineers where they're all, you know, tigers when it comes to concrete and steel. But the moment you take them into softer natural materials like wood or stone or brick, uh, they tend to forget their basic engineering principles. So we're certainly looking towards uh you know, our international counterparts for some of that knowledge sharing uh, to be brought into this country. And yeah, those are some of the, you know, finished Im images of the work. Um, so yeah, of course, apart from the primary system, we did look at the louver systems, uh, you know, also also in wood and uh, kind of opens up the possibility of combining different structural techniques. And um, learning from that project, we, I think this is something that is more recent, completed in 2016 in the Western Ghats. Uh, very close to Bombay. Now, I'm not going to get into the, you know, the why the house and how the house more kind of step into the wood part, but it's a, you know, a heavily sloping site. Once again, working at levels, working within, uh, you know, spaces offered by the forest. And here we actually were able to uh, take the structure and make it even more radical because we were kind of freed from the minor constraints of the terracotta tile system, which simply wouldn't work when you started to, you know, mutate these roofs to be able to follow the the slope of the land. And uh, yeah, it was interesting uh, working with a wonderful set of engineers, uh, you know, developing detailed drawings for this structure. Once again, working uh, with a combination of flitched drafters or flitched members and uh, solid wood sections. Uh, this was sol wood. Uh, we got some of it, some of it was new sol wood. And I think the rest was uh, from ship breaking yards in, uh, in Gujarat. So if you track it from the top left, moving right into the bottom, we simply analyzed how a traditional pitched roof, as it had to start adapting to slopes, adapting to heavy wind speeds, which means heavy rains, having to stretch its wings a little bit further and start to mutate its geometry as it flows down the hill, you know, tracking essentially the the occupied platforms and, uh, and the slope of the land. You can actually see how those roof forms start to mutate. And um, yeah, translating that primarily through uh, through through flitched wood and yeah, working with zinc uh, over here. So we obviously had a lot more flexibility with regards to the geometry uh, of the wood. But again, you can actually see that it's tremendously versatile in the way that it can be used, particularly if it can be combined with other uh, slightly more high performance materials. Um, with regards to the kind of sourcing of the wood, I, I, I do think that we tend to be engineering wise a little bit conservative because at least with local woods, um, we're not quite sure how it's been processed, how it's been treated, has it been adequately seasoned, has it been tested for, uh, you know, compression, cracking, moisture, etc. So we tend to be a bit conservative and I do, uh, you know, again, sense that that kind of knowledge sharing with uh you know, whether it's you know, the Canadians or the Scandinavians or the Japanese in terms of being able to be slightly more precise with the engineering of this wood. But um, yeah, we were able to, you know, kind of work again with these hybrid tree-like forms and the branches to completely open up panoramas to the forest beyond. Um, and again, just working with, you know, local carpenters and it's, it's amazing the kind of craftsmanship that we have locally available, you know, it's just a question of maybe challenging them, taking them out of their safety zone, because most of these guys are delighted uh, working on actual load bearing structures, you know, uh, like this, as opposed to simply doing, you know, doors, windows, tradings and claddings. Yeah. And, you know, once again, just engineering, if you you have these beautiful views on one side, you can actually just, you know, support and cantilever the structure of the other and 
Yeah, I think that the possibilities are absolutely numerous. You're connecting back to a structural material. And I think all the benefits of timber have already been outlined. So I'm not going to go into that. Yeah, I think that's 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 pretty much it. That was fantastic, on the, uh, Arjun. Honestly, it, it's so great to see uh, timber being used for modern structures as well in a very contemporary style. And that uh, some of those projects definitely did take the cut for that and uh, it was really nice to see that. Uh, Mr. Pandala, yeah, we know your love for vernacular architecture and Marjun just showcased how we can also use wood in a very modern manner. But still, there is a lot of resistance towards using wood in our country. Why do you think that is the case? And how can we address that? Yeah, I mean, uh, resistance, maybe uh, it's there because of the cost involved in the, in, I mean, the environmental cost and also the cost of, uh, you know, timber, which is available for, you know, it's available for, for I mean, people who can afford it. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, the, the small problems like, uh, like white ants, people are scared of using certain type of timber. But there are certain type of timber which is not affected by, by termites. So I prefer to use that. If you treat uh, timber by using, I mean, if you're using um, pesticides, it, I feel it's, we have to use very safe, uh, I mean, pesticides. So we have to show what, it, what we are using. I mean, so we, we have to actually build very cleverly so that uh, this, uh, this white tents doesn't come up and uh, get, you know, a place in the timber from where it can really uh, eat up. Because it's, that's looking for its uh, food. So naturally, we have to take care of it. We have to use our intelligence to sort of uh, make it, uh, you know, if you, are, if you are willing to sacrifice, uh, then it's okay. But otherwise, we have to be very careful. There are a lot of safe uh, chemicals and uh, treatment systems which we can use. And like you rightly said, it's also down to the architecture and the engineering. If used rightly, I'm sure you can get the effect that you are looking at as well. And plastic substitu substitutes are coming up, you know, like uh, which mimics uh, timber. So I don't really appreciate that kind of thing. You know? There are like some people make timber like plastic just by polishing it and you know uh, removing the texture. They really spoil it. They love showing a polished kind of uh, situation. It's like plastic, absurd. But timber should be shown as timber. It should have a look and feel also. Absolutely, it's not yeah. Absolutely agree with you. In fact, Peter uh, even mentioned by some of the panelists earlier and in the audience that there is a lot of people who are asking about the carbon footprint of India importing Canadian wood, or for that matter, from anywhere. Would you like to address that question? Yeah, thanks, Sumisha. Um, let me apologise in advance. I've got one of my neighbours uh, decided to do some major renovation here today. So I've got drilling and banging. This may be why I prefer wood over concrete. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, Nirmala really addressed that, uh, that subject about, uh, you know, uh, CO2. I mean, the, the work is done in the forest absorbing the CO2. Um, obviously, in manufacturing that log into lumber and then exporting the lumber by ship to another country, we sacrifice some of that CO2 credit that we've gained. But the, the net position is that by importing wood from Canada to India, uh, it's, it's a net positive result still. And uh, unfortunately, India is a, is a fibre deficit country, you know, and uh, the teak forests here have been overlogged and the, the government uh, rightly locked up those forests and those hardwood forests. Um, there's a huge, uh, you know, um, deficit in India uh, in terms of wood for manufacturing and wood for structural use. I really applaud uh, uh, the architects today who are, recycling wood, uh, finding a use for coconut wood, uh, using mango wood in furniture, all of those things, wonderful things. Um, but even, even teak these days, the uh, majority of the teak being used in India is imported. Uh, it's coming from uh, plantation monocultures in South America and South uh, uh, and Africa and, and Asia. And uh, unfortunately, it's the only solution. We're not, there's not any 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 projects of scale or where wood is used is needed for, for, for you know, manufacturing or building in volume uh, needs to be imported. Um, and there's lots of benefits of the, in terms of the lumber that comes from Canada, in terms of specification, 
you know, lengths being eight to 20 feet, uh, coming from sustainable, manageable forests, uh, coming from a country with 0% deforestation, uh, coming as sawn, uh, accurately sawn, graded, certified, and even structurally graded wood. So there's lots of good reasons to bring wood to India from overseas. Uh, Canada's just blessed with, uh, with uh, these enormous softwood forests that are, are managed well uh, by the Canadian government. Sorry. Regine has a question for you. See, uh, I have seen your ancient slides, you know, the, the slides that we showed felling of trees, you know, clearing of one particular area fully and, uh, uh, you know, making it for fresh plantation. Instead, uh, the forest department has a different kind of system where uh, you are, you can fell the trees not uh, as, as a whole, as not as, not make it as a huge field. But if you can pull out few trees, you know, which are mature and which can be, which is pretty old enough from from the bunch of forest, you don't make a, a, a ground, you know, like a airfield, like what you have made for new cultivation. Yeah, I, I think, so you're, I think you're referring to clear felling, um, you know, and this is a this is an age-old system, you know, that's, that's uh, designed to control costs. But you know, there's a lot of selective logging that takes place in the Canadian forest. Also, uh, I 100% agree with you. No one wants to see ugly, uh, clear felled, uh, you know. Um, paddocks or, or spaces on mount, on hillsides, uh, but um, this it just it just needs good management. And, and as long as we manage that well, and we consider the environment, we consider the public, uh, then you can definitely uh, log um, sustainably and economically. Um, I, I think you were referring to the Indian hardwood forests just then. Uh, no, actually, what what you're doing, you're just considering the tree as just a tree, but a tree is just not a tree. It has got a lot of, uh, you know, it's a host, I mean, for various biodiversity. You have to consider that. So you cannot shockingly remove, uh, you know, a, a community of trees. You know? it's, basically, it's a community. So it's, a, it's just not, uh, you're not seeing it as a living organism. That's a sound. No, I 100% agree with you. And that's why we, that's why we plant uh, trees, the same species, in the same area. And we maintain the biodiversity in Canada very much so. All of the forest we're talking about in Canada is is, uh, plant, is natural forest. Th these are not plantations. These are not mon monocultures. We're not destroying the the, the, the forest uh, cover or the under under part of the forest. In fact, you know we're only logging less than one percent of the commercial forest. There's so much forest which is protected in Canada, it's an enormous amount. So if you consider that we're logging less than one percent of the commercially available forest. It's a very, very small amount, uh, which showed up as a red dot on normal, normalist map. So it has to be, it has to be responsibly done. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, I agree. And I think we can, we can claim that. Yeah. Siddhartha, you are working on a project with Canadian Boat currently, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, what was your thought behind choosing a Canadian Boat? Um, can I just share my thing as a yes. response? Yes, and yeah, if you have any, you also work on a lot of cultural projects, so we'd like to see That's some right. of those as well, yeah. So the project uh, that we are working with Canadian Wood is the JD Center of Art in Odessa. Um, it's an amazing project for us because it's about, it goes back to the notion of what is art about and about how does it transcend boundaries and how does it bring people together. And especially in today's times when there are so many divisions that are more and more, I think, rampant. So with that kind of mandate, and especially in Odessa, um, so that so basically it'll house the collection of Jatin Das, the artist. And the idea is that how can we do something which is not just about that collection? Because the collection also has a whole variety of crafts and textiles and contemporary arts and an amazing collection of fans. So here there's an amalgamation of wood, metal and textile. And it's, a collect it's part of the collection that travels. So it kind of brings together the JD Center of Art and the work we do, do with culture. And it, the building is designed very sculpturally by B.B. Doshi. So you, you have the kind of mass uh, massing of the models. And then the way it has to kind of occurred at the site. So the site is very beautifully um, undulating. It's rocky. And, oops, sorry. And you have this kind of very lovely sculptural kind of um, 
occurrence. And at Studio Van Roo, uh, which uh, was associate architect with Bibi Doshi and the, uh, the whole engineering of it was by Mahindra Raj. So it has the same quality, I think in some ways, and yet unique. You have this beautiful verdant green landscape in the front of Khandagiri Caves. And you have this kind of undulating heights and play of flight, but also you see kind of the rocky terrain and you know, it's punctuated with art, which is there. So there's a beautiful uh, sculpture by Shorbir Rai Chaudhary, by K. Sada Krishna over here under the Jamun tree. You know, and that is the beauty of it, that the idea is to not really, um, to tread kind of gently on the terrain. And that's the, uh, the building of how it will look. And this is where I think our whole collaboration with Canadian work uh, is going to occur in a large way. So we have, we want to create uh, spaces which are very experiential. And in today's time, I think when we say experiential, people just assume it's always technology. We naturally want, we embrace technology a lot, but we also want it to be about workshop oriented where there's, um, you have tools uh, and the tools are used and you have a workshop within the gallery and outside it. And so it becomes like a exciting, and I won't say it as a classroom, but a kind of a thing where there's participatory uh, which is built into it. So that's a beautiful, so that's the fan collection, which I was showing you earlier. So the fan textiles and basketry come in here. You see uh, very seamlessly the way the wooden furniture comes into play. Uh, and that's another gallery you see. Uh, so the beautiful form of this having this large heights and um, having a kind of a slattedness uh, so that the light is uh, less harsh because we naturally it's a museum collection. And we spent a lot of time looking at the ecology of the building and how it will, the site also. So we spent about a year with a physicist doing a thermal mass assessment and looking at the particle matter, the humidity and temperature. And I have to uh, correct uh, one thing that I'm actually not an architect. I have the good fortune of working with architects um, and I, in my team and otherwise lovely people like here, but um, I am a designer by profession, but I, I interface a lot with architecture. So here I, I'd hired a physicist who actually did a lovely assessment for us. So we come back and think about how do you have cutouts in slab and how do you have convection currents that flow through it and also harnessing light in an interesting way. So how does the art really come in? And then how does the slattedness really add to the light but not too harsh? And there's a whole play of that. So the beautiful kind of arches that Doshi had created, you know, when he had this idea but how do we make it in a way that will not be harmful? So here the wood comes in again seamlessly. So we didn't want to create very small kind of uh, apertures at the top. And then the whole different structure of having kind of temporary structures. So that's the ticket shop and the uh, security uh, that people come through right in the beginning. That is something that we did in our studio ourselves. But again, this whole play and a beautiful multi-purpose hall so that when we have artists in residence and craftspeople in residence, so the, the art center does not differentiate between artists and craftspeople, designers and architects. We want it to be something that celebrates the idea of creativity and also without the idea of elitism. You know, uh, we, many of us have the good fortune of having access. There are many who don't, and this is situated in Bhubaneswar where access is a huge thing. And we want people to realize that that celebration of creativity is when you come in there and experience it. So that's our kind of slatted uh, roof and things. And again, there was a question that was asked is, um, is wood used as a decoration and is it also structural? So here it's a play of both. We have a PEB building with wooden uh, systems and the entire exhibition system, when there's a gallery showing, then it comes into play. There's a film showing it behaves differently. When there are talks, it behaves differently. Uh, I just wanted to kind of also weave in the whole cultural aspect of our studio's other work when you asked, you know, what kind of projects do we do? Um, this is a beautiful old heritage site designed by the architect in 1936 who made the Umed Bhavan Palace. It's called Sadagam Museum in Jodhpur. Uh, we were asked to curate and redesign it. And that's how it looks now after we finished. And that's uh, other spaces. We kind of just opened up the space and the same idea of the idea of responsibility. So we didn't have a single aperture in the heritage building. All our air conditioning is through the windows. Our lighting is 16 meters high, but also, you know, how do you really work with, how do you tell the story and the narrative of things that I, you grew up with? Uh, this was a project at the Victor and Albert Museum in London. Uh, this was way back when I was younger with more hair. <laughs> so uh, a while from now, this is, 
a lovely little exhibition based on a much larger project we're doing of interpreting the temples of Puri and Lingraj. Um, my, my parentage is mixed. I'm half Gujarati, half Uriya. So um, this is naturally, as an Uriya, this is quite important because these are two kind of iconic temples. But also in today's times when, you know, there's this extreme amount of ritualic uh, fervor with which people come and talk about temples. So we wanted to tread gently and, you know, talk about the whole idea of the built heritage, the iconography, the living traditions, but also showcase it in a very modern way. So this is, I met uh, Canadian Wood after this project, <laughs> otherwise this would have been a very interesting way to collaborate. But also working with craftspeople and talking about things, you know, the way the films are made, the way the people made the things. So that's a beautiful architectural model that we did in collaboration with craftspeople. So one of the things um, which you mentioned, uh, you know, one of the things I really pride myself in is that whole trajectory of having worked a lot of craft people at the same time working in technology, of embracing both and you know having a reality which is of both. So there's a beautiful teak wood log which had been felled by an elephant in the forest, not far from Bhubaneswar, about 300 kilometers sourced from the forest department um, ethically. So that was also interesting, a hundred year thing. We took the sculptors to it, to the sawmill, got the log of wood and from this over the next 16 months, something was created. But one of the things I think when you talk about ecology, Ini talked about coconut, uh, Eugene talked about, uh, sorry, not Eugene, um, Tony talked about uh, using arecanut. Um, I worked a lot with bamboo in our exhibitions and things, you know, because it's, it's, a, it's a grass and it kind of, it regenerates itself. I worked a lot in Tripura and Assam and Orissa and Delhi, and we do exhibitions which use bamboo quite a lot. But also for furniture, here's a kind of a knockdown bamboo stool. So sometimes it's repurposing crafts, but sometimes it's crafts the way they are, with the same symbology in ADM. So this was something we showed at the 100% Design Festival in London. Uh, and then the other work, which is heritage-based, which is this, the Jal Mahal, and working with the kind of the, the traditional idiom of that area. So we often, when we work with heritage, we work within a radius of about 100 to 200 kilometers of the site. So that here, this entire thing celebrates the arts of the 19th century when this building was created and the whole kind of working with it within the space. Uh, but contemporary things, there's a South Bank Center, you know, where it kind of celebrates the arts in a very different way or using film. And uh, so this is the entire scaffolding is made in wood and it has textiles of different sheerness. And then the whole projection of sound and music uh, within that space. And you see again, the usage of wood over here but of film and music again. Uh, this is with a Norwegian company actually. And then the work we did with the airport, the Bangalore airport, where we created art for large installations. Um, and basically, yeah, that's, that's so kind of just to kind of give a smattering of the work with culture, but also how does the wood really fit into it and the idea of ecology, because how do you work with people in places if you're, if you're not sensitive and if you're not responsible? And, you know, uh, and you can't then say that one is responsible and have uh, an insane way of approaching it. So I think that's the, being the kind of uh, the premise with which you know, our studios work. Absolutely. In fact, I found something you said very interesting is that a lot of people tend to relate innovation with technology, while actually innovation needs to be going back to the roots and using the uh, traditional vernacular architecture in a more modern manner. On that note, I would like to invite Ravi to share with us some of his works and, uh, you know, where he's used wood as well. So be, you know, more or less, I think I completely agree with most of the sort of critiques that we've heard today. But of course, I also think that we must be the voice that we walk and talk. Right now, I'm sitting on the level three, which is completely a timber structure, five floor timber structure, which is our office space. We built 12 years ago using re-engineered timber and yellow balao and uh, waste that we got out of pulling down old warehouses where they had to do some old mills reconstruction work and stuff like that. So, so we started actually looking at a whole structure in a simple trebiation method without complicating the whole building where we used very, very minimal steel. This was on two houses, which was built before independence. And that's how the office structure sits today, which is completely five floors. And we also have an amphitheater. These are precast concrete panels that we house on top of the timber structure, which is actually five floors high with a whole volume touch that happens in between. And there's a large tree that sort of gropes onto the terrace level where we left that structure only two floors, but otherwise we have three floors, four floors of uh, volumes that happens as office spaces. 
And you can see that it's a composite structure where we used simple method of trebiation and used only two and a half kgs of steel per square feet and used largely compression member of timber. The whole window and the door frame, everything act, actually acts as a support structure and it also houses an amphitheater which can have 150 people for a concert. So it is possible and actually we realized that doing this way we, we were destroying the, the local sort of area of constructability area into a uh, uh, lesser degree that was we were not inundating the land, there was no cement, there was no uh, mortar, there was no, you know, chemicals being used, no resins and everything is a carpentry joint and bolted systems. So it was fascinating for us as part of that experience. Even now, I'm sitting on a floor which is two inch thick wood, which came from re-engineered re uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, reuse and that itself is the floor. There's no concrete there. And believe in me, it is cost effective. You have to go to the source. You have to go to the farmer to buy the rice. Then it works better. You know, so we also believe from that point of time, you know, like just a couple of weeks back, we harvested the first chop of timbers from our land. We grow 76 acres of land where we grow trees, not like a Miyawaki forest, but we want to grow enough trees that before I die, that whatever timber I've used, I would have put it back into the planet Earth so that I equate my number game. So having said that, recently a large project which we did for around 75,000 square feet, uh, a, a, an old heritage building which was 130 years old, we had to actually completely pull out all the roof elements, all the window elements and reuse every bit of that timber that was used in that particular structure, but added a bit of extra other surfaces of timber and managed to uh, bring back the whole club into life. And added to that, we also extended a large, uh, uh, you know, 16,000 square feet sort of open kitchen zone with cafes and restaurants, which added as an extension to that space, which was all built out of timber. So my, my priority is not just about timber. It's about, as I mentioned, the measure, the energy measure of the material. When we built a corporate office for, this was recently completed, 7 million square feet as VA Group, we built it for Wipro. Now, this completely has huge contents of terracotta and fly ash, which means to say when the building sort of gets back to earth, you will realize that it would, you know, least sort of degrade uh, the planet and biodegrade itself to the best possible method. And the whole ground that we created was done in such a way that we actually created more surface earth than that there was earth before. So these kind of number games are very important in terms of how you landscape the terraces, how you bring timber into large semi-open areas. The whole building is a veranda where only 36% of the carpet area is actually air conditioned and the rest of it is just open verandas just like the old colonial buildings. And it's possible to extend this idea to corporates and very large projects and impress the client to believe in you to bring the agenda of sustainability, not necessarily that everything has to be in timber, but has to be very, very responsible and how the whole space works. And a project which uh, we completed a couple of years ago in uh, Pune, uh, which was for the Lucan Laboratories here, the whole perimeter skin is a composite structure of timber, aluminum, and steel. And it actually goes back and connects back to a building, which is completed in RCC, which are very, very high-end laboratories. And the whole idea of bringing glass to three floors is also that we started planting extensive amount of landscape by giving large depths of spaces around the ground, which allows you know, the glass and the outdoor spaces to connect completely and not have any glare. Today, the whole building is sitting in a forest. You can't even see the building when you pass by. You know, it's so much wooded around this landscape that you're actually sitting in a garden when you're working, sitting in a glass house, but looking at outdoor waterscapes and landscapes. And it was fascinating that we were more concentrating on doing these outdoor areas than the laboratories, which was actually the functional aspect of the building. But then when we went ahead and certified, it went above the grades of certification. And that becomes significantly important. Make your employees grow your vegetables, bring in em enough amount of you know, knowledge space to how you even program the functionality of the buildings to, to allow this kind of, you know, connect that happens between people and the occupants and the management. And, and so the architect's whole game plan becomes almost equivalent to that aspect. So before I shut, uh, I'll uh, just quickly uh, run through these slides, which are uh, the large club space, which is 130 years old building as to how it was renovated. That's the existing building. Now we are adding another two faces to the whole structure and we are programming a material which would be very austere and soft to this old kind of colonial building. What you see here is all timber that was 130 years old, pulled back, reconstructed, 
requalified even the floor for example we made sure that the flooring was reused and whichever panels were not available we got it recast using the same you know composition the wall plasters was all done in the same composition and we could manage to change the architecture to bring in a good reuse to the whole space and facility added we didn't change much to the exterior but as we walked into these spaces actually the active spaces of the club we started working around the courtyards there's a big opera house in the middle so we started working with every room to re attention a new function re qualify new cafes coffee shops you know new kind of ideas of the interiors which changed and brought about a new understanding of the new age times and the present sort of physicalities that would be required to make the building which is 130 years old relive for another 200 or 300 years old and all this was again done with we engineer timber so that you have that sense of a uh, material being very austere and not loud to an existing old fabric and that is the structure which we built which is 16000 square feet all in timber completely all in timber which is like a huge uh, wing of it we use yellow balau and sal and this has huge spans of 14 meters where we could bolt elements of structure and erect them to come together and uh, it is a show kitchen where people can see their food being cooked they can go to the chef and ask him to add a pinch of salt or pepper and walk out and sit in the cafe and the restaurant and and have a great meal and all this roof that you see and the columns and even the floor pitch and the batten structure the rafter structure you know this brick lining and also the way the whole perimeter structure of that is being held is all part of the timber area and these are some of the slides that show you of the interiors of the heritage building where we had a lot of waste wood that was available out of the site we used them again back to the floors to make furniture to make wall panelings and extensions of wall spaces to bring back a certain glitter of the old times but at the same time bring in a new definition of what the architecture could read uh, to open spaces and live spaces of such kind in an old building and and that's the big shiva's bar which is again completely done out of reengineered timber and furniture uh, the conference rooms and the president's lounge and of course the large opera hall which is like a dance space plus people play housey housey every week three times and it's a fun space so therefore how do you do all this with uh, the same timber that was there 130 years old pulled back into position and regroup so this tells you a story that the material timber is invincible it will live for a thousand years and nothing will happen but concrete is the criminal you know otherwise <laughs> everything else is fine thank you that was incredible ravi and uh, i think i think some of the structures and some of the things that you said i completely resonate with you as well and i think so does peter he seems to be nodding his head a lot <laughs> in fact ravi you also mentioned about lead points in one of your projects so peter would you like to take us through there any lead points that you get if you work uh, by using wood or canadian wood in particular and do you also offer any kind of technical assistance no, absolutely because if it is uh, it depends on which you know what's the measure of the carbon footprint for example what we did for lupin or what we did even for wipro we got a lot of green marks because it was coming from harvested wood like what i tell tell you now is that when i use a new piece of timber as long as i make sure that the ecological footprint is accurate i am actually a green boy if i can generate power the office that i'm sitting in right now generates 12 to 13 kb of power through solar we are completely disconnected from kb from the karnataka electricity board and we feed power you know to the electricity board and actually get money back so there is a way to do that where you have to do a sort of an exchange you know program it's not about you know what i used for one particular rafter or one particular batten you know at the end of the day the mathematics is very very important if i can grow before i die enough number of trees that would equate or be more than what i have used i think i'm a green boy so uh, similar to that most of these facilities such as wipro and lupin have actually graded out of uh, gold rating to platinum because when we got evaluation teams to come and understand how we had done the whole program we got many marks for innovation we got many marks for being very very passive in most of the areas where 40 to 50% of the whole space is not air conditioned we we did innovations innovative systems of of ventilation so there are the the aspect of of doing of course today is we are focused looking at peter but uh, having said that the way we approach green is a much more sort of megalomaniac possible kind of an arena and we all have to sort of get off that space and become more responsible and uh, 
talking to the farmer and asking him to grow your rice is beautiful or to grow your rice and consume is beautiful. So you grow your own tree and build a tree house. That's beautiful. You know? Absolutely. I think Peter, he's answered your question. Would you like to add to that as well? I could, <laughs> nothing I can add to that. It was an amazing answer and uh, yeah, perfectly well put. A wonderful uh, presentation, Ravindra. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we're running out of time. So I'm just going to take the final notes from everybody. Mr. Joseph, would you like to uh, summarize your thoughts on using wood, particularly uh, in the projects that you've done? And if you have a message for people who've come here to listen to you. Nothing more. It's being sincere to yourself and to, uh, to the, the world we are living in. I think our resources are... Uh, the way we use our resources, which are very limited, we have to be careful. Like, uh, and whatever we do, I mean, we can talk a lot at the end of it, you know, it is being sincere to the environment. I think Absolutely. that's all. Hmm? Absolutely. Mr. Chatterjee, anything, any message for the young architects here today? I mean, just be gentle. Siddhartha. I think um, just the fact that I think we all are so lucky to get the kind of projects we get and it comes with the responsibility of doing something and you know being just treading gently and responsibly. I think just that. Absolutely agree with you. Eugene, Mr. Eugene Padanda. Any final notes for our audience today? This is all about what you're talking about. It's all about you know aiming at sustainability, you know, using timber as a as a building, important building material. Yeah. But I mean, we have to make everything affordable, you know, because the need of the hour is to. We are aiming at something, you know, for 2030, 2050, you know, carbon about carbon footprint. So uh, if it reaches only five uh, percent uh, of the population, you know, with kind of green rating and rated uh, green building, other other buildings are not sustainable. That's what uh, somebody claims, but. Of course, all kind of sustainability is, uh, is to be welcomed. You know, you can have a green rated building for people who can afford it. Let's say, for example, platinum rated or I mean, gold rated buildings. All these things uh, is good to talk about. But that is just not the you know, point because we have a uh, timeline is very important. You know, we have to be make our, uh, all the building projects there's a lot of questions. Today is architecture, world architecture day. There's a lot of questions now, you know, new questions are coming up. How do architects respond to this kind of responsible situation? Because uh, lifestyle modification is what everyone is talking about. You cannot talk about uh, a bedroom with 150 square feet or 500 square feet. You know? We have to think uh, logically because we have to give, make a reasonable, you know, Help to the environment. We just can't. Uh, yeah. We have to be affordable, in short, and it should, we, should, we should make it affordable for everyone. Then only we can achieve this uh, this this aim of making reducing the carbon footprint by 2030 to certain uh, you know levels. By 2050, also we have certain milestones. We have to achieve that. So we have to ask a lot of questions. You know and find answers for it. Absolutely. Arjun, any closing note and any message for architects who want to work with wood? Yeah, I, I can tell you one thing, that wood isn't uh, a get-out-of-jail-free card, right? Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's relevant to a context, so you can't make a structure in wood and then sheath it completely in glass and say, okay, my structure is sustainable, right? It's a... Uh, I think if you're going to kind of acclimatize yourself to what Ini said, first of all, be gentle. I think that's the primary thing. If you have a sympathy for the environment and for the ecology around you, whether it's culture or social or anything related to our you know, immediate environment, I think the answers kind of will present themselves. I'd be very, very cautious because we are more and more, you know, trying to get the stamp of sustainability, which I'll say it again in a, uh, in a country like ours is could be a bit of a red herring, right? Because I always look at buildings that are clad completely in glass and I think how the hell could you possibly get a platinum rating on that building, right? There's no sense of orientation. So you create a problem, then you start throwing, you know, triple laminated and quadruple laminated glass and then you put in efficient air conditioning systems. But the point is, 
you create this problem and then you try and solve it. You know, maybe if you thought about things in a more common sense way, and I think we have an immense repository of accumulated intelligence in this country, right? Decades, centuries old, which is telling us how we can build sympathetically for different environments, right? Now, I'm not saying we all go around building mud huts, right? But there is something to be learned from all of that that can be applied in the mainstream across larger scales. Right? So each thing in its own context, uh, the point is architects, universities, industry, we get together, we start to find solutions, right? If we simply become, you know, operate in silos and become guinea pigs for, you know, the industry, um, there's always going to be a disconnect, right? Um, so, yeah, I guess that's, that's a little bit I have to say. That was fantastic. Peter, any final words before we wrap up the session today? I'm farting a bit with my uh, neighbor's uh, renovation, but uh, I would just like to say a couple of things about cost. You know, uh, this has been raised a number of times about affordability. And I think when you think about affordability, it's not just the upfront uh, cost of wood. You know, it's all about installed cost. It's about how quickly you can build in wood how you can prefabricate in wood and you can very much reduce your footprint on the site where you're building. So you use less footings, less concrete, less foundation, less disturbance, less water. Uh, you build more quickly, you prefabricate, you transport to site. You can build on steep sites, mountainous sites, at the end of narrow tracks, on beach fronts. These are all uh, eminently wonderful ways to use wood in construction. And it can be used in such a way affordably. It doesn't necessarily need to be so expensive. So I'd just like to leave people with that message. And uh, another message also might be that, you know, the um, strength to weight ratio of wood is incredibly high. It's equivalent to steel or better. And anything, any structure you saw today, any structure you saw presented today can be done 100% in wood. And we can do very long spans in wood we can, we can substitute concrete with wood. We can substitute steel with wood. So there's, there's no impediment. Uh, and as long as we keep uh, the environment in mind and we draw the wood from environmentally uh, responsibly managed, uh, you know, forests such as we have in Canada, uh, and we do it, you know, in a sensible way, in a simple way, uh, and we design well. You know, everything, it's all about design, whether it's termites or water mitigation, uh, or, or structural values or orientations, all about design, and all of those things can be mitigated in wood very easily, very simply. And so that's probably the message that I would leave with you today. And Lovely. thanks very much for a wonderful session. Thanks. That was fantastic. Ravi, before we sign off, last words? You know, Pablo Neruda told his girlfriend, said, I want to do to you what the wind does to the cherry trees. Uh, so we need to kind of shake the goddamn tree and make it vibrant and alive and wake up. And that's how he expressed his passion to his girl. So I think as architects, we need to kind of reinvent, you know, go back to our books and papers and pages and history and sort of relearn and emerge into a new ideation of empathy and, and be austere and reduce use. Uh, so I think these are very, very pertinent to our times. And to be what I want to ideate is very, very important, you know, to live and, you know, grok to the spaces and the things and what I do in the evening should be as responsible as I propagate to life. I think if we do that, you know, we will be an amazing life to live by further on. On that note, that was incredible. And on that note, I think it's time to conclude the discussion. I think we've established today that uh, it's time we all start making changes to the way we build and design so all of us can be proud of what we are leaving back for our future generations as well. I sincerely thank each of our panelists for joining us today. It was a very good discussion and we hope to have many more like this in the future as well. Just before we sign off, I'd like to invite Nirmala to make the vote of thanks. Thank you, Suvisha. I'll not take much of your time, but it was certainly a very engaging panel discussion. I truly also believe we have a commitment to our future generations. I just, on behalf of uh, Canadian Wood, <clears throat> would like to thank architect Ajul Malik, architect Eugene Pandala, architect Ini Chatterjee, architect Ravinder Kumar, designer Siddhartha Das, architect Tony Joseph, Peter Bradfield representing Canadian Wood, 
thank you annabel for the uh, bearing with us with all this time and of course sumisha for an excellent moderation thank you very much for uh, taking time out and attending this i hope to see you all soon thank you bye